This is Matthew Cratter from Bitcoin University. And today I wanted to talk about trading in and out of Bitcoin, trading Bitcoin, selling it for productive assets, and also how to create a synthetic dividend using Bitcoin. This is a follow-up to yesterday's video, which was about the dangers of quote unquote taking profits on your Bitcoin. So if you haven't watched that already, I would suggest that you watch it before viewing this video. I first want to respond to this tweet, which was a response to my video saying basically, you should sell your Bitcoin for a million dollars because cash is stable. Your million dollars will still be a million dollars after a year. Your Bitcoin might lose 50% if you're in a bear market. I think this misses out on the point that on the fact that fiat is a melting ice cube. It loses purchasing power over time, certainly loses a lot of purchasing power over long periods of time. But even when you had in the US, we had inflation of official inflation of somewhere around eight to 10%. And so your million dollars is not really worth a million dollars after a year, as this commenter says. Another comment from Tom saying, I remember hearing Larry Lapard recently talking about Bitcoin overshooting its fair value in the 2024 halving and selling a few coins to quote unquote, take some profits, maybe around the 120K or 150K range. Even if the idea was to buy back the BTC at a later lower fiat price, are you still against taking profits to buy back Bitcoin at a lower dollar price? In other words, should you sell off some Bitcoin during a bull market in order to buy it back during the next bear market? I think that's actually a really, really risky strategy. First, there's the embedded assumption that you actually can predict the broad outlines of Bitcoin's price action over the next few years, when the truth is you probably can't. So what if you sell some Bitcoin at $150,000 per coin and it keeps going up and up and up and never sees sub 150K prices ever again? And if you believe as I do that we're headed towards hyper Bitcoinization, it's definitely where we're headed. We just don't know exactly the path we're gonna take there. We should expect at some point Bitcoin to pass 150K or 500K or whatever it is and never look back. That's what hyper Bitcoinization implies. Another analogy, which I mentioned in yesterday's video was, was it wise to take profits on the US dollar against the Turkish Lira or Argentine Peso in order to buy back in at a later date? There were some dips here in the US dollar Argentine Peso exchange rate. We can see some down here, but the much more rational strategy, both from a lifestyle point of view where you could just relax and also from a tax efficiency point of view was just hold US dollars never convert them back to Argentine pesos and never convert them back to Turkish lira because those are two fiat currencies that are sinking much faster than even the US dollar. If you're enjoying this video so far, I just ask you to hit that subscribe button. That would really help me out with the algorithm. Also leave a comment or question below if you have one. The other problem with trading in and out of Bitcoin also is the tax problem. So let's say you buy Bitcoin today at $30,000 per coin, you sell it at $130,000 per coin after hodling for more than a year. In the US, you will owe long-term capital gains taxes against this federal taxes, not to mention state taxes if you live in a, a, a state that has a capital gains tax as well. So you'll owe taxes on that 100K capital gain. It's usually about 20% depending on your income. So that would mean you owe taxes of $20,000. So your after-tax proceeds from this trade are actually not $130,000, but $110,000, assuming you need to pay some taxes on that. And so that means that you need Bitcoin to trade down to at least 110 k to make this trade worthwhile. Otherwise, you'll essentially be buying back in at a higher price, higher post-tax effective uh, price than what you sold it at. And that may never happen. As we said, Bitcoin may just continue to appreciate. In fact, many early investors in Bitcoin who sold some have never been able to get back in. You can see these examples all over Twitter. Here's a guy, Captain Bitcoin in 2015, I sold 800 Bitcoin to buy a house for my family. In 2018, I sold my house and was only able to buy back 50 Bitcoin. People who think I'm crazy for selling my house, please know that my only regret is to have sold my Bitcoins. And this is from a good tweet from Luke Broyles that discusses this. If you trade in and out of Bitcoin, there's a good chance you'll never be able to get back to that original number of Bitcoin that you own. I thought Superhero Armory Channel had a good uh, question here as well. Can you please do a video explaining why you insist on never selling your Bitcoin at any price? I can't wrap my head around the concept of holding a non-productive asset forever. I asked him to qualify and clarify what he means by a productive asset. And he gave the example of T-bills producing a yield, dividend stocks, rental properties that produce a return, 
etc. My answer to Superhero Armory Channel would be this. All productive assets like rental houses or businesses have maintenance costs. If you own a stock, you're essentially just owning a look-through business. So that includes stocks as well. All productive assets have maintenance costs, confiscation risk, operational risk, other regulatory risks, etc. Bitcoin also has regulatory risk, but it's much more portable than real estate or most businesses or even stock. It's very difficult to take your stock with you if it's trapped there in a brokerage account and they won't let you take it with you when you decide to move jurisdiction. So Bitcoin has regulatory risk, but you can always move it to a more friendly jurisdiction if you need to. The other problem with productive assets is that their prices may not keep up with inflation, especially when there's very high inflation, which can make maintenance extremely expensive. So for example, let's say you bought a Zimbabwe house many years ago for 50,000 Zimbabwe dollars. Now a new roof costs 5 trillion Zimbabwe dollars and you can't afford it. So now your house is going to become a moldy mess when it rains. The other question to ask, of course, depending on your jurisdiction and how bad you expect things to get, was it a very good idea to own productive assets, either rental houses, physical businesses, or stocks in Zimbabwe, Venezuela, Russia, China, even in Germany, the stock market, I believe, basically went to zero after World War I and after World War II. Certainly in Russia and China, productive assets were confiscated by the hostile governments. West Coast Ace 27 thought I went a little bit crazy in that previous video and yesterday's video. He says, you went a little too crazy with the society's collapsing stuff. I'm a libertarian, but you sound so extreme. You should be prepping out in the wilderness. Well, maybe I am. I do live in Colorado. He says, instead, I should be buying real estate in safe places like Monaco, Singapore, Dubai. And my answer to him was, do any of those countries have standing armies or nukes? Do you want to live somewhere that relies on the American nuke umbrella to protect you? If you think societies can't go from bad to worse, you've never read anything about the Russian Revolution, the Chinese Communist Revolution, etc. So this is basically, if you think Monaco is a safe place, it's a very beautiful place, but you're looking in the rear view mirror and owning real estate in Monaco, going into, or the word Monaco physically is going into World War I or World War II, or whatever's coming may not have been or may not be a good idea. The other question that really goes back to Superhero Armory Channel was uh, this common question that I get. I don't like Bitcoin, quote, I don't like Bitcoin because it doesn't pay me interest income, dividends, royalties, other yield in the same way stocks and rental properties can. I've heard many people say the same things about Amazon over the years, certainly in the late 90s and early 2000s. Amazon to date has never paid a dividend. This begs the question, should you have sold your Amazon stock in 2000 and moved the post-tax proceeds into a quote unquote productive asset like an apartment building? And I would say the answer is no, not if you understood that Amazon still had a very, very long runway and was quote unquote eating the world as software does and would massively outperform any real estate holding in the world. As for dividends, there's this concept in modern finance theory that if a stock does not pay a dividend, an investor can always create a do-it-yourself dividend or what's called a synthetic dividend by selling off small chunks of the stock on a quarterly or annual basis. You can even do this on a weekly basis or a monthly basis if you wanted to. Yes, this does reduce your principal, in other words, your total holdings of the stock, but that's not a concern if the asset is one that should continue to appreciate forever or for at least for a very long time. So it would have been a big mistake to sell your Amazon stock in, for example, in 2000 and move it, move the proceeds into a dividend stock like Coca-Cola, for example, just because Coca-Cola did not have the same runway or the same growth, even though it did pay a dividend yield, you were much better off leaving your money in Amazon. So what we as investors and as people trying to protect our savings are interested in is total return and increasing purchasing power over time rather than rental yields or dividend yields or interest income from treasuries. And that interest income from treasuries is always lower than the inflation rate. And that's one way that the government confiscates your money as well. As for Amazon, Amazon definitely made the right decision to reinvest all of its profits back into the business or into stock buybacks, which it started doing in the 2020s, rather than paying them out to shareholders as a dividend. Here's a log chart of Amazon's price. You are definitely much better off owning this than owning anything that had a yield, even though Amazon continues and has had a 0% dividend yield over this period of time. It was very clear to me in 2000 that Amazon would continue to eat the world. And it's now very clear to me that Bitcoin is going to do the same thing over the next decade 
but at an even more global scale and with even higher returns. Bitcoin is a great place to save. It's the perfect savings technology because it's money that cannot be censored or debased. It doesn't have operational risk like stocks do, like companies do. It doesn't have regulatory risk in the same way that, for example, having a rental property does. For example, during the pandemic, a lot of landlords were not able to collect rent. And we could see something similar, especially if non-house owners uh, mobilize politically and try to stick it to landlords. So that's one great danger of owning rental real estate anywhere that you think is going to weaken private property rights. Unlike real estate, Bitcoin's money that can't be censored or debased. So feel free to spend your Bitcoin on goods and services when and if you need to. There's no, no shame that comes with that. It's really your money after all. But I want to just say here that I still believe that selling Bitcoin to invest the proceeds, the post-tax proceeds, into investment real estate. It's one thing to buy a house to put it over your head uh, and you can have some sort of freedom that way, freedom from landlords, but selling Bitcoin to put the proceeds into investment real estate, rentals, stocks, bonds, etc., is a huge mistake in my opinion. That's not diversification, that's diversification. You need to do your research though and spend a lot of time thinking about Bitcoin before you can get to this place. And it's definitely, I'm not making an investment recommendation here that you should take all of your savings and put into Bitcoin. But I think the more you study it, this is definitely the direction that you trend. And I think this meme from 2020 still holds up quite well. Uh, the uh, matrix sort of Bitcoin meme. What are you trying to tell me that I can trade my Bitcoin for millions someday? And the answer to Neo is no Neo. I'm trying to tell you that when you're ready, you won't have to. The same goes with Bitcoin. We're going to be able to spend it in the future. We're going to be able to easily borrow against it in the future. And there's really no reason in the interim to trade out of it, to either trade in and out of it, to trade, uh, to sell it for crypto, to sell it for fiat, or to sell it for traditional fiat assets. You'll just end up massively underperforming Bitcoin and getting much poorer relative to Bitcoiners. If you found this video helpful, be sure to hit that subscribe and like buttons. Hit the notification bell if you want to be notified when I publish my next video. And let me know your questions and comments in the comment section below. Thanks a lot for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.